Thank you so much for being with us today. I'm Jordan Chavez, and this Pride special you are about to watch is a product of love. From myself, from my producer, and really the entire team here at Nine News. Unfortunately, this product of love was created just before an act of hate. On November 20th, 2022, a gunman targeted Club Q, an LGBTQ bar, and on that night, five people sadly died and more than a dozen were hurt. Our hearts are with them, with their loved ones, and with our LGBTQ plus community. We wanted to let you know there are ways to help the victims and people most impacted by the Club Q shooting. And if you would like to donate, the Colorado Healing Fund has been activated. It's a method to donate in a secure way that will go to the people impacted and their community's long-term recovery. Help is also available 24-7 through the Colorado Crisis Services Hotline. The phone numbers are on your screen right now. You can call 1-844-493-8255 or you can text the word talk to 38255. We also have more resources specific to the LGBTQ plus community and details on how you can help families impacted by the shooting right now on our website, 9news.com. Now, we don't know what will change and develop in the many times the special will air, but what we do know, regardless of what evolves in this tragic case, the LGBTQ plus community will always need safe spaces and allies. That is exactly what this special is intended to provide. We hope you laugh, join us in tears, and above all, we hope you learn how to find resources you need and how to be a better ally. Without further ado, may I present Colorado in Color, an hour-long presentation to elevate and celebrate the voices in Colorado that truly make us colorful. Elevating the voices, sharing their stories with pride. My mom told me that she doesn't think she's ever seen me this happy. And I feel the same way. A look at the history. It's validation for humans who had a little part of them hurt. You know, yeah, the history matters. That continues to be written today. Some folks are gonna celebrate and other folks are gonna continue to push and fight. And I think we have to do both. And a look to the future filled with hope. This is Colorado in Color. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Jordan Chavez, and this next hour is dedicated to the stories done to elevate and celebrate the voices in our state that truly bring the color to Colorado. And while we hope you laugh, maybe relate even, most importantly, we hope you learn. One of the most important lessons anyone can and should learn why we have a Pride Month each year. Pride as we know it today, parades, rainbows, and concerts, began with a clash between the LGBTQ plus community and New York police. In June of 1969, police raided the Stonewall Inn, a popular gay bar in Greenwich Village, claiming the property had violated liquor laws. As police officers began making arrests, those remaining gathered outside. Now, at this point in history, homosexuality was still considered a criminal offense, and it was common for police to raid bars like Stonewall. But this raid led to a nighttime riot. Over the next six days, thousands took to the streets in protests. In 1970, on the first anniversary of the police raid there at Stonewall, activists organized the Christopher Street Liberation Day March, the start of the city's first gay pride week. And now that you know the history, the question remains, is pride a celebration or is it a fight? Nine News reporter Katie Eastman tried to find out. You know, I think pride is, it's both. Well, I mean, you know, here in Colorado, we have the most protections for LGBTQ Coloradans than um, any other state in the nation. Um, and you can get comfortable with that. My name is Nadine Bridges. Um, I'm the executive director of One Colorado. Um, and yeah, it's Pride Month. And some folks are going to celebrate and other folks are going to continue to push and fight. And I think we have to do both. Texas is targeting transgender proposal, kids. Critics Tell call the don't say gay you bill. Know, there no, seems to be this gay. drive towards attacking LGBTQ youth and young adults for political gain. It would actually make it illegal to take children to drag shows. There are many people in our community who are still vulnerable. Um, the transgender community has been impacted um, exponentially. Families, if they think the child's gone through transition care, like hormone therapy, it will be considered child abuse in Texas. Um, as uh, One Colorado, we've had very difficult com conversations around um, uh, potential attacks. They were on their way to a Pride event in the town of Coeur d'Alene, where police say they were prepared to riot. Among them are three people from Colorado. Once the glitter is all swept up, 
and the fight's a little bit quieter for the day, um, we should be protected and celebrated 365 days a year. It doesn't end at the. It doesn't end at Pride. It doesn't end on July 1st. Um, I'm still queer. Um, I'm still black. It doesn't matter. And so we still need to do more every single day to ensure that we have the protections for our community members. It's important we mention a woman that many in the LGBTQ plus community credit with the advancement of advocacy. A person who lived in the intersection of racism and homophobia, later becoming a champion for LGBTQ plus rights. Marsha P. Johnson, a transgender woman, is largely credited for throwing the first brick that sparked the Stonewall riots, though Johnson said she didn't arrive until after the riot started. Johnson later went on and founded the trans youth organization star with her friend Sylvia Rivera star housed and fed homeless youths. The intersection of being black and belonging to the LGBTQ plus community clearly did not stop with Marsha P. Johnson. Nine News anchor Alex Lewis spoke to those who knew what it means to live in that intersection. When you're black and queer in Colorado, it's an exhale, a space to freely breathe can't be overstated. I think it feels like sometimes you have to choose between being black or being gay and spaces like this really remind us that you don't. You can show up as you truly are. This is the second annual Black Pride Colorado Gala. Happy Black Pride weekend, everybody. And if you ask those in attendance, it was born out of necessity. I would go to Pride, but not see myself. I would go to Juneteenth and still not see myself. And so then it kind of, within those cracks, that is where Black Pride was created, and that is why I became a co-founder, because I wanted to make space for folks like me where they embraced an intersectionality between being Black and queer. Obviously, it's been missing. We sold out today. Felony so. Misdemeanor says the Black Pride movement is about being proud of thriving through oppression and pain. The top Black is not beautiful. Black is ugly. Black is less than. And so that's why we're like, no, we are beautiful. We are worthy. We are Black, and we're proud. Say loud. We really are the underdogs. You know, we really are the ones who are not seen and not heard. It, it's no joke. Because if it wasn't, we would not be here today. The theme of the night, the Harlem Renaissance, a story time in American history fueled by the contributions of many black, queer artists and literaries. That's a special history that doesn't, quite frankly, get lifted up in general pride celebrations. Dr. Darren Stewart doesn't take a night like this for granted. To just live in that, um, that space, that special space uh, that celebrates who we are and who we have always been and what we have contributed time and time and time again to spaces of art and music and activism and politics throughout time. When you're as unique on the inside as the choices you make on the outside, you deserve to be seen in all your glory. For the community to show up in your beautiful self, in your authentic self, and not be afraid to do that, where you actually feel safe in a space where you will actually be welcome, which when you are black and queer, there aren't that many spaces like that here in Colorado. LGBTQ plus history, unfortunately, is not so distant history. Those who lived through the Stonewall era still face discrimination today, specifically in health care. The American Heart Association estimates that 56% of LGBTQ plus adults experience some form of discrimination from a health care professional. Arjalisa Irizarry spoke with a University of Colorado researcher who has dedicated her career to studying end of life care and is now focusing on elderly people in the LGBTQ plus community in hopes of sparking a change. You want, oh my God. God, look at us. You'll love this. Time can be such a thief. Babies. It robs adolescents. Let's see what else we have. It makes people like Nancy Johnson Bookstein okay. crave those moments. That's another picture of us. It leaves Joan Johnson <laughs> overwhelmed with nostalgia. Yeah, we're older than because you had gray hair. Time may have taken their youthful glow, <laughs> but in return, Here it gave them a lifetime of memories. She was the only one that stole your heart. Absolutely, absolutely stole my heart. The two have been together for 45 <laughs> years. It's obvious when you look at their home, the pictures of all that they've achieved, the reminders of all that they've lost, and the subtle signs that time is running out. It has now become reality for us. Yeah. Um, Joan's got leukemia. Um, we are 
we are blessed by the fact that we have been given time to end this journey together. So we would have loved to have moved into a area for seniors and um, we probably could do it, but only undercover. At the corner of East 19th in Uvalda, fear and reality are on display. So this is Joan and Nancy. The quote says, our life wish is that there would be retirement communities for us LGBT people. We don't want to die with a bag over our heads. And by the bag, I mean we don't want to, after this lifetime of being open and out, have to go into a community, retirement community, and hide who they are. Carrie Candrian has spent the last few years eye to eye with elderly people in the LGBTQ community, asking them their deepest worries and then revealing it in the name of science. 56% of LGBT adults experience some form of discrimination. And the big one is that the stress of hiding something so core of, of, of who you are can take up to 12 years off their lives. And I think it's it's easy to, to look away when you hear sort of general numbers about groups of people, but it's much harder when you, when you see someone, when you know them, even love them. And so this was the idea to really be able to meet some of these people behind the data. Behind a camera, Kandrian shares what statistics cannot, the faces they ultimately impact, the older generations. The majority of older LGBT grew up, people grew up being gay or lesbian was unthinkable. It was dangerous, even illegal in most places. And for that reason, many of them have honed what I call this habit of silence about this core part of themselves. The reason that Esther's story is, I mean, so powerful in so many ways is as soon as I heard it, it's impossible to forget it. Esther Lucero is a face on this wall, a woman who hid her relationship when her wife Kathy got sick. Kathy told me one day she said, stop telling the nurses we're married. She said, because they're treating you differently and they're treating me differently. Kathy's care got worse because she couldn't have the person she needed in the room to advocate for her. She only didn't want to come in the room. She wasn't known as a grieving spouse who just lost the love of her life. That part hurt. <sighs> These stories may not change things for the faces on this wall, but the hope is that no others will have to be added. Oh my God, we grew old together. How did this happen? At the Johnson Bookstein house. You're so cute. It, it has been an interesting journey. Things may be dwindling down, but their passion isn't. I don't have that many more months to be able to uh, make a change, but if I'm still up and moving around, I'm gonna do what I can. But we still ride the motorcycle. We still ride the motorcycle. <laughs> Moments like these may be fleeting, but no matter what's around the next turn, time can't close the door on memories. Jalisa Arizari, 9 News. LGBTQ plus folks also face high numbers of mental health issues. LGBTQ plus identifying kids are four times more likely to attempt suicide than their peers. And now the LGBTQ plus community is not inherently at risk for mental health issues because of their sexuality or identity. Rather, the risk comes from the mistreatment and the stigma that exists in society. That's why safe spaces are so important to the well-being of the community. 90s reporter Katie Eastman spoke with a mother who watched her train transgender daughter go through a mental health crisis. So she created a safe space, not just for her child, but for anyone who needs to feel safe. My answer is I'm out of time. In the basement of Mary McRae's house, her accolades dot the walls. Well, I'm a professional singer songwriter. I've done that my whole life. But these days, her music has one message. I was just, I was really trying to find a reason for it all. Mary wrote this song in the parking lot of an emergency room where her transgender daughter was being held after going through a mental health crisis. Tell me there's a reason. After the emergency room, there was no place for her daughter to go. I can't break free. Mary had her voice, but felt helpless. I just wanna share this because when I found this in the back of her car, when I helped her clean out her car, um, she transitioned two years ago, and it says freedom is found when we let go of who we're supposed to be and we embrace who we really are. 
And I, um, you know, I started this so my daughter would have a safe place to go. Come on, Sam. Sam. This is what she started last year. Come on, Sam. A nonprofit LGBTQ sanctuary. This is Heart Mind Haven. This is a respite. It's a healing um, recovery and wellness center. We have not had any relapses. I know we're new. Um, I'm new speaking about this, but um, it is amazing. I think just what that love and unconditional support um, does for people. Their director of transgender and recovery services knows the need. Uh, a lot of our transgender residents are either brand new in transition or <clears throat> have been in for a while but have just had really, really bad experiences, which unfortunately exists for a lot of us. Cameron Byrne says this kind of place provides that continuum of care that's missing in the system. You know, how do we start to live our best life as trans women or trans people so that we're not always in crisis mode, which is where we tend to live? Music will always give Mary a way to share the suffering she's seen. You deserve a chance. But in her words, she found her own reason. Over and over. We have a choice to be a messenger from where we've come from. And how do you walk through a war? And how do you feel those bullets? And how do you see people dying from those bullets and do anything different with your life? Now, you don't have to create a program or host people in your home to be a safe space. You can simply take steps to learn about the community and make sure you're a safe person. One way to do that, make sure you understand the concept of pronouns. Language will keep evolving and we kind of have to keep up with it. Ahead on Nine News, a group discussion on a simple question with hefty importance. What are your preferred pronouns? It's becoming a more common question to ask. What are your preferred pronouns? The topic may make you feel uncomfortable. Maybe you're just nervous to say the wrong thing and offend someone. That's why we sat down with the center on Colfax to explain how to have a respectful conversation when it comes to someone's pronouns. I was hoping we could talk a little bit about the pronouns you use, they and them. We were talking about the fact that sometimes in conversations we're going to get that wrong. Mm -hmm. What do you tell people if mistakes happen? Right. So the best thing to do is to apologize. It doesn't have to be profusely. You just say, hey, you know what? I messed up. Mm -hmm. Then you correct yourself and you just keep going with the conversation. Do you feel like, you know, with pronouns, this is something that's like new for a lot of people. We're trying to figure it out, right? If, if people are just kind of trying to get it right, that's showing that you care, that you're making an effort. Correct. And also it's really important that you correct yourself, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't matter if it was um, an accident. You want to acknowledge that it happened and then correct yourself and keep going with the conversation. I think we can tell when folks are being sarcastic about mm -hmm. it and when they're genuinely um, you know, upset that they did something that could yeah. hurt you. Education, I feel, is so key with this, right? right? And I know that you go around and you speak to groups about it. What are you most commonly asked? Um, oftentimes, I'm told that they, them, is not correct for a singular person, mm. which I understand. However, we have expanded how we see ourselves, right? I identify as a non-binary person, which means that I'm not a man or a woman, right? And sometimes people will see me as one or the other and they will call me that, but I'm neither. So I prefer to be using they, them pronouns for myself. And I think it's important for visibility as well because I do work with so many kids who are not in the binary, right? And so I feel like identifying myself is also important for visibility purposes. If you have any lingering questions and you want a safe space to ask and make sure you are educated, of course, you can always contact the center. You can find contact information on the center's website, lgbtqcolorado.org. Part of being in the LGBTQ plus community is taking a big risk. In some cases, 
coming out. We want to highlight a fellow journalist making history right now. Nora J.S. Reichardt has been reporting at our Iowa sister station since July of 2021 under a different name, though. After gradually coming into her identity as a transgender woman over the course of several years, she began a medical transition in September of 2021. Now she is publicly reintroducing herself and sharing her transition experience. I love the Des Moines Metro. I've, I've come to love Iowa. And I'm glad that I get to keep sharing how much I enjoy those things. My name is Nora J.S. Reichart, and I am a transgender woman living in Des Moines and working for WOI Local 5. For a long time, I didn't think I would get to say that, at least not on air like this. I didn't know if there was a place and a space for me to do this sort of work that I've really come to love and enjoy while also getting to be myself while I do it. Especially early on, it's hard to place that sense of wrongness. Like I'm just a person who's almost wearing my body, not a person who's living in it. In late high school, I started having some thoughts in that direction, but it was at a time growing up in a pretty rural area that I didn't even have the language to describe what I was feeling. I thought I was just depressed. I thought I was just anxious. And I've had those feelings almost as long as I can remember. A while after I started being on air, I kind of just reached a personal breaking point of like, why don't I like the person that I'm seeing every time I'm going out in the field? It is hard to overstate the devastation that this community has seen. Why don't I connect with that person? Why don't I want to be that person? We'll keep you up to date here on Local 5. I started counseling last September, so I've been in some degree going through this process for just about a year now. I've pursued a more medical intervention. I am on hormone replacement therapy. There was a decent span of time where everyone in my life functionally knew me as Nora, except for the viewers at home. Steph, many of us might not realize it, but hearing aid prices can be staggering. Feeling like I was splitting myself into two like that. It's very weird to approach like every day at work as if it's a dress up day, but that's really what it felt like. When I made this exact leap of telling the viewers at home, everything was going to be different, that the little, the little name under my, my headshot is going to look a little different now on air. And I, I wanted to personally feel as ready as possible to make that jump because there are expectations that come with it. So uh, today, really big day for me. I'm officially filing the paperwork to legally change my name. In the state of Iowa, you have to file a petition with name change with, with the local court, and that's what I've got here. I've got everything printed out. My, my dead name and my hopefully soon to be permanent name after this. This is just my uh, credit card information, so uh, please don't get this in the shot. <laughs> uh, continue there. Reviewing payment. Submission confirmation. There we go. When I stepped away from work, it's the last thing I had left on my to-do list to feel like I'd accomplished everything I wanted to while I was gone. So in many ways, this feels like an end and a welcome back. I'm very fortunate that I'm in a position where my, my coworkers and my employer want to support me in this. Morning, Theo. Good morning. Good to see you. I had all of those support systems and I had so much help in this process. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had Khalil and Larissa's story yesterday, kind of. I texted them this morning yeah. uh, to be like, hey, how did things go last night? No response yet. Simon had that shooting info that he put in. We're living in a time when there's so much misinformation floating around about people like me. I promise we're more interesting than, than bathrooms or sports or whatever. We're still living wonderful, fulfilling lives outside of that. I'm still very much the person I was before. I still know too many Spider-Man facts. I still play a little too many video games for my own good. I still enjoy reading at the coffee shops around Des Moines, which is where you can usually find me on my days off. None of that has changed. Especially for people who feel like they have a personal relationship with a trans person, it's understandable that it can feel like a loss. But the way I would ask people to reframe that is 
you're getting someone better. You're getting someone that that person is so much happier being. What really stuck with me is when my mom told me that she doesn't think she's ever seen me this happy. And I feel the same way. And to know that other people are seeing that too, especially my mom and dad, who I love so much, I can do anything as long as I still have that. I'm grateful to be here in Iowa where I've felt very supported as I've gone through this process and I'm excited to give people at home a closer view of what this sort of process looks like. At the end of the day, I am still the person that you've been seeing on TV for the last year or so. I'm just a little, little happier while I do it now. I just hope that I'm a positive part in people's lives, big or small. And as long as that can still stay true through all of this, the rest is noise. Nora shared her story with CARE 11 reporter Eva Anderson, who used to work at Nora Station and photojournalist Mitchell Yale. How do you want your loved ones to be remembered? A difficult question to answer when what was left behind is tainted by hate. Still ahead, the parents of the late Matthew Shepard share who their son was and hopes to direct his legacy. It's a story that rocked the LGBTQ plus community, one that caught national attention, the death of Matthew Shepard. On October 7th of 1998, Shepard, a 21 year old student at the University of Wyoming, was brutally attacked and tied to a fence in a field outside of Laramie, Wyoming and left to die. He died from his wounds in a hospital in Fort Collins. This year, we spoke to Matthew's parents about who their son was and how they want the public to remember him. What I wanted to know about Matt was that he was a human being, first and foremost, more than a photograph or a story or a victim of a crime. I guess it was his smile is what I think of first because he had such a big, big smile and it was so real. Like one of his friends said he smiled with his whole body, which actually depicted it pretty well. When he was little, he wanted to be in the theater and he loved it and he was really good at it. He had the lead in uh, Whatever Happened to Wanda June and I was just, Awestruck. And he said to me one day, do you think I'll ever be famous? But I'm sure he didn't envision this kind of famous. This is the name and this is a story that woke people up. And I think everybody needs to realize that the amount of violence is still there and is still occurring. And the amount of discrimination is still there and still occurring. And he'd be disappointed that we're 20, 24 years later, we're still fighting this battle, straight or gay. It's not just the, the gay kids, it's every kid needs an equal chance. Two incredible parents, Dennis and Judy, opened the Matthew Shepard Foundation in the aftermath of their son's death. And their hope is to honor their child's life and aspirations by teaching parents with LGBTQ plus children to love and accept their children for who they are. Among all the great work they have done, like pioneering the country's first federal hate crimes legislation, they also raise money each year through a special show. It's called Drag Eye for the Straight Guy. Our very own Gary Shapiro participated this year, getting coached by his own drag mom and becoming the fabulous Matzabelle for one night. Drag Eye for the Straight Guy takes four straight male contestants, turns them into drag queens, where they compete for the title Miss Bear to Make a Difference. While the event is incredibly fun, trust me, it's also incredibly important. The proceeds raise money for the foundation and its programs. The foundation says the public often assumes they are on par with organizations like the Trevor Project, though that's not quite the case. They still need community donations and assistance to continue to do their amazing work. It's only been very recent that drag shows became popular. Our Gary Shapiro sat down with his drag mom for a look back on not so distant history of acceptance. out in the um, LGBTQ plus community and we were in the bars and we were doing shows, but we weren't mainstream kinds of things. We weren't really out um, about town and things doing it, um, but we started pushing that envelope. <laughs> 
performed on Larimer Square for their Busker Fest. Um, we got a gig at Lanny's Clock Tower Cabaret um, and were there for nine years. So we definitely started busting things open, crediting RuPaul with a lot of that. Hey y'all, my name is Simone and I am the winner of season 13. In that particular show has moved drag to more of a center stage, more accepted, um, definitely. Um, I think that that is where we started to um, see the, the coming out of the underground, coming out of the bars and being more um, widespread. I have found that drag has been a real release of me being able to be creative in a different way, me being able to put my spin on things. And I think that once people get past the look or past the thought, and they start to just enjoy the performance, I don't think it matters anymore. I think gay, straight, or otherwise. People see the fun, people see the entertainment, and people enjoy the show. Drag is a means of self-expression. And here in Denver, there is a nonprofit using drag as a way to help educate kids and their parents on identity and the LGBTQ plus community. In just two and a half minutes, a focus on safe spaces in the metro area for anyone looking to explore who they are. A safe space for kids and parents. Denver's Dragutant is more than just a drag show. It's a community for those starting to find their identity. Nine News executive producer Victoria Valenzuela found drag is way more than just glam and flair. Yes, good. Not trying to be happy. Hi, my name is Jameson from Generation Drag, and my drag name is Ophelia Peaches. Hi, I am Honey Bun, a 15-year-old drag queen, and out of drag, my name is Erin Michaels. They may look young, but do not underestimate these queens. To get to this level of fabulousness, it takes community and understanding, and that's exactly what Dragutant provides to kids in the LGBTQ community. We create a space where the kids can come, and perform and be affirmed in their gender wherever they are, wherever they find themselves on their journey, and feel amazing. And it all started with a mother's love. My child, when he was 13, says, Mama, I want a drag queen themed birthday. And I thought, all right, you know, we can do this. I wore a pink Goodwill prom dress, a peach colored bump like Southern Belle hair, and I had my makeup done so dragged up. I didn't feel like I was looking at a different person. I felt like I was looking at who I wanted to be. His mother saw the person he always was, just a little more authentically. And I've never seen my child light up like that. And all the lights are shining on his tiara and his little earrings. And he looks over at me and he says, Mama, I feel more me than I've ever felt. And I, I get choked up when I talk about it. And it hasn't always been easy for Robin. And I thought, how am I going to raise a kid that wants to do drag? How do I stumble through this? We started with, with doing a photo shoot. We had some local drag queens come and do makeup. And then one of the people who was mentoring said, oh, honey, you can't just have a photo shoot. You have to have a ball. We realized that in the drag community, in the LGBTQ community, a ball is where you wear your best gown and you just are yourself and it's performance. From there, Dragutant was born. She created a space for me so that I was safe and that I had people like me and that these other kids could experience what it felt like to be themselves and explore who they wanted to be. And I love my mom so much. Now, beyond letting kids have fun and express themselves in a safe setting. Just honestly, it's just a ton of kids running around just like a dance recital. Dragutant provides something else something just as important. Draggy Taunt gave us our community. Parents that are like me with kids like me and gave him um, a way to connect with other kids. And when she finally let me do it, I felt so free and the most confident I've ever felt in my life. Building community, connection, and confidence 
for kids who may not find it elsewhere. Ever since drag, I've just felt so powerful and like I could take on the world with this. It's an amazing feeling and I just love it. He can just be exactly what he wants to be in that moment. Authentic and true to themselves. Everything a mother could want. It, it's been the best thing I've done for my child, listening to them and kind of following his lead. I'm a proud mama. Dragutant is an act of pure love on and off the stage. Love your kid. Love your kid. That, that's it. Love your kid. There's no other answer. Dragutant is also featured on a Discovery Plus show called Generation Drag. If you are interested in connecting with the organization, just head to dragutant.org. Part of getting to know yourself and truly uncovering your identity certainly takes a lot of work internally and externally. A salon here in Denver has created a space for LGBTQ plus individuals to become exactly who they want to be. A change in season can sometimes hello friend bring a change in perspective. How has life been? Uh, life has been pretty good. And anyone that sits, I think, therapist is like in yeah. Ezra Burns' chair can see that. It's what I identify as. Yeah. <laughs> Identity, it's something she does not take lightly. It's yeah. not just like me cutting hair anymore. When she knows some in this world are constantly having to stand up for theirs. I feel like the queer community has not been seen for so long. And to be able to step out of your house and be like, I'm representing who I am and my community, that's so important. That's so important. What's important to Ezra is making sure all have a space to share who they are. I don't care. Her booth at this Fort Collins hair salon aims to be one of those spots. Just to create a safe space is my number one. And I think a lot of people don't feel that in a salon environment. Ezra identifies her hair business as a place for all LGBTQ and non-binary folks. She offers non-gender pricing, which means everyone pays the same no matter their hair length. So to be able to show people that haircuts, it shouldn't be like a classist thing. It's like you are born with this. You should feel comfortable sitting in a chair receiving a service on like a level playing, playing fields. It's just how it should be. Lauren Domingo is one of her clients. She knows just how important hair can be to identity. Personally, like uh, I had a time in my life where I had lost all my hair from um, medical treatment. And so I have it. Once I got it back, I was like, I'm gonna do all the things I wanna do to my hair because you don't know how long you're gonna have it. Time is something Ezra hopes brings more understanding and more conversation. We need to keep doing that. Yeah. Regardless, because like you can have that conversation and years later it's more impactful for the same person, you know? Knowing how someone discovers themselves can bring change. How do you feel? I love it. But embracing its fluidity. It was lovely to see you. Can open new doors. Jalisa Rosari, Nine News. We want to take a moment to remember a woman who made Colorado more inclusive and equal for the LGBTQ plus community. Cleela Rorex became the first county clerk in the U.S. to knowingly issue a marriage license to a same-sex couple. This was back in 1975. Two men from Colorado Springs came to her asking for a marriage license after being denied in their home county. She agreed, and Rorex issued five more over the course of a month before Colorado's attorney general told her to stop. Colorado law at that time did not specify that marriage had to be between only a man and a woman. The DA said, you can do it if you want, or you can say no. Don't think I ever had a moment of saying to myself, I wish I had not done that. It was simply a matter of right and wrong. Rorex grew up in Steamboat Springs. She came to Boulder in 1970 as a student at CU. She resigned as county clerk in 1977, her first and only stint in public office. Rorex dedicated the last years of her life to advocacy for the LGBTQ plus community, volunteering without Boulder County. She sadly died in Longmont back in June of this year at 78 years old. And he said, I'm gay. And I looked at him, I said, I know. And he said, you know? I said, yes, I know. I said, I'm your mama, I know. The search for safe spaces and community starts with the coming out story. Still ahead, my own mom shares her perspective of the day I came out and her message to other parents of LGBTQ plus kids.
when you are still in the closet, it's like holding your breath and you are just waiting for that moment when you can finally breathe. Last year, I shared my own coming out story to our Nine News viewers, a story that is very personal and very different for every single person in the LGBTQ plus community. My story started with my mom. She shared her perspective on my coming out with Nine News anchor Corey Rose. He felt shame at school. He couldn't speak up. You know, he couldn't say anything because, yeah, Texas, we're rough and tough and tumble and we carry guns and we play football. And, and Jordan did all that. You know, he just happened to be gay. If you know Jordan, you know he's full of energy, has a smile that can light up the room and a personality even bigger. <laughs> Jordan is high strung, life of the party. That's what you see on the outside. But inside, he struggled with who he was and how he felt from the time he was just a toddler. Jordan, from the time he was like three or four, we were going through McDonald's ordering Happy Meals and he would beg me to get him the girl toy instead of the boy toy. He was holding a secret, a secret he thought he was keeping from the one person who knows him best. We were actually in the middle of an argument <laughs> and he was crying and I knew it was more than just the argument. And he said, you don't even know what I'm about to tell you. I said, well, why don't you tell me? And he said, I'm gay. And I looked at him, I said, I know. And he said, you know? I said, yes, I know. I said, I'm your mama, I know. When he acknowledged it with you, did that at all change how you parented Jordan? Um, my son is my son. I loved him before, I loved him then, and I'll love him forever. I love him, you know, he's my child. Does it make you so happy knowing that Jordan can just be who he is now yes. and not have that burden, not feel that? Yes, I do, because uh, Jordan's a great person. He deserves a good life, and he doesn't deserve to be hiding from anyone or, or anything. A big sigh of relief. Her son doesn't have that shame to carry anymore. I'm just happy with, with where he's at right now. And now her message to parents who may find themselves in a similar conversation. Before you open your mouth, step back, you know, count to 10, take a deep breath, and remember, this is your child, and he will always be your child. Just love him. That's all he needs from you right now is just your love. And I'm thankful for her love and the love of other parents just like her every day. With any luck, parents inspire their kids to go on and start their own families. The path to family looks different for everyone. For Denver locals, Ty and Brian, that path included surrogacy. They started sharing their journey with a podcast in hopes of raising awareness and to show other couples that achieving what may seem like an unattainable dream is possible. You're listening to It Takes a Village, Our Path to Leo. Having a baby is, has been a dream of ours. The podcast has eight chapters documenting their journey to their son, Leo, and it also honors their surrogate, Amber. It tells the complete story of a, a family that many families might not know, right? If you don't know a gay family, um, you know, you, you just might not know the story and it might be just curious to people. Their podcast can be found on Apple and Spotify. Just take a look for It Takes a Village, Our Path to Leo. Ty and Brian's efforts to build community and understanding spread far beyond that podcast. 90s reporter Victoria Valenzuela spoke with their neighbors who now all raise the rainbow flag in support of their friends and anyone else who needs an ally. We're all a family on our little Dexter Street block here. We all just get along. Four years ago, Brian and Ty Roy Garland put their Dexter Street family to the test. Delivered a letter along with a pride flag all about how important inclusivity and support from um, the community is as gay, a gay couple. And they asked that we all fly our pride flags during the month of June. And Dexter Street more than delivered. And every year everybody puts it out and it's just a it's just a happy place. You get uh, chills thinking about it. When you drive down this block, you can't turn your head without seeing a rainbow. It's just part of our culture. We've had some turnover in different houses and the new people always go out, they get their own pride flag. A symbol born out of adversity. It's, it's validation for humans who had a little part of them hurt. You know, and so it's, uh, you know, yeah, the history matters. Now a symbol of hope 
for future generations. And I think what really resonated to us was we have we have an 18 month old son and the, just the impact of seeing a street like ours can have on especially a, a young kid, I think really, really, you know, kind of hit home for us. I want that for my kids too. I don't know who they're gonna be, but they should be who they want. I think for our son, um, you know, it's, it's beautiful to know that the community around him um, embraces him. A love that spans well beyond this neighborhood block. I know for certain that there is, there is a, a couple kids every year who probably come down this street who are struggling, who don't feel okay, the grown-ups in their lives are not telling them they're okay, and they come down this street and they see a whole group of grown-ups who are telling them they're okay. So for anyone in need of community this Pride Month, if you could describe this neighborhood in one word, what would it be? Loving. Accepting. Unified. It's a family-friendly neighborhood. I'd say love. Just head down Dexter Street. For Nine News, I'm Victoria Valenzuela. Neighbors say they even beat Ty and Brian to the punch, getting their pride flags out before the couple does for Pride Month. Still ahead, strengthen your safe space or start building one today. We have a list of resources for LGBTQ plus folks and their allies. It's coming up right after the break. We thank you again for joining us and sharing in this space to elevate and celebrate the people of Colorado who truly make our state colorful. Stay safe, give love, hold your chosen families tight, and always remember there are resources and allies for anyone who needs help.